How many's got your Bibles? Let me see those. Hold them up. Electronic Bibles. Let me see those. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Hallelujah. How many of you were a little bit intrigued by the title, Betraying Jesus? I was pretty impressed today. I went to Walmart with Nick, and uh, I was buying supplies for the church, so I got to present the tax-free card, you know, so I have to go through a line. So we waited and got to this gentleman, and he had a clean smock except for his name tag and then a pen that said, I love Jesus. And I said, man, I said, that's all. I'm loving that pen. And there wasn't but one for him to know what I was talking about other than his name badge, right? So he's like, man, he said, I appreciate that. And uh, so he's looking at the card. He's typing the numbers. He says, no excuses ministries. He said, you know, no excuses kind of reminds me of the scripture in Romans 120. And I said, you want one? <laughs> Huh? So I slid one of those wristbands on him. I mean, I'm, I'm recycling these bad boys real quick. I get, that's why I wear two on each wrist, because I wind up giving them away. Then I come back to church and replenish, right? Because at no point I feel naked now if I don't have at least one of them on. So I got three that I give away without being in trouble. So I thought that was a first. So uh, if you guys see Mike as a cashier at the Walmart on 19th Street, go through his line and encourage him, because he's sure representing Jesus. Subject matter today, betraying Jesus. I had a few titles. That was one of three. Another one was the spirit of Judas. And another one is Judas Kiss. So I've been talking to some people in recent weeks, and we're probably getting close to a time when I need to revisit the subject of deliverance. Um, I try to do that once, maybe twice a year, and thus far we've not done it at all this year. And I don't remember when last year we did it, so we may be pushing right at a year or so since we've done um, a teaching and, and some mass deliverance. Um, but the reasons for that are numerous. Firstly, we forget because we get busy and we get trespassers, and we don't realize we're dealing with trespassers, and we think that our spouse is the enemy, our job is the enemy, the church is the enemy, everybody's the enemy, because we allowed trespassers in our life, and we forgot to address them. Secondly, the enemy gradually and craftily increases his influence in our life many times without us recognizing it. It's kind of like gaining weight, you know what I'm saying? You get a half a pound here and a pound there, and you don't even notice it, Right? Until, you know, months down the road, you look and it says 10 pounds. Now you're noticing something, right? But you didn't notice it before that. That's how the enemy works. Um, thirdly, there's open doors that we've missed and unknowingly open. See, a lot of people wouldn't have thought that somebody saying, I want to pray for you is an open door. Well, it just depends on who's wanting to pray for you. Y'all ain't hearing anything right now. Number four, a recalibration of our thinking and perspective to be attentive to spiritual things. We get so caught up on getting enough rest and making sure we've taken our vitamins and make sure that we get up in time to go to work and that we get off on time and that we have family time and social time and church time and God time. And, you know, we're so consumed in the natural that many times the, the supernatural and the spiritual don't get the time and attention that it needs. Another reason is reinforcing biblical teaching regarding the war that we're constantly in. See, it's amazing to me that everybody in this room right now, whether you understand it or not, you're in a, you're in a fight. Sometimes it's a fight for your attention. Sometimes it's a, it's a fight for your affection. Sometimes it's a it's attention for, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's a fight to concentrate on the word or the spoken teaching or 
You know, we get distracted. Somebody going in and out to the bathroom or a crying baby or somebody spilt their drink that they weren't supposed to have in here. And you know what I'm saying? It's just anything to get our attention. And we fail to understand that the enemy will use everything that he possibly can in order to get influence into our lives. And lastly, repetition assists us in staying spiritually clean. Listen, I don't care what brand soap you use. If you do not apply it regularly, it will not do the job it needs to do in your life. And su- such, such it is, or so it is, sounds a little better, with deliverance. It's not a one and done. Well, I've already been through that. You smell. I already took a shower a month ago. <laughs> huh? And so uh, I'm telling you because I need you to prepare your hearts. It's not just me preparing mine. I need you to prepare your hearts. And I don't care how many times you've heard it. If you're home folk, you probably heard it several times. Um, but I'm going to tell you that watching somebody cook and being familiar with how they cook is totally different than cooking yourself. So just because, oh, he's going to do that again, you don't know which time I'm going to point at you and say, hear that devil? Get it. So while I do believe that the attacks of the enemy are becoming more varied, and they are, more frequent, and they are, I by no means am making up a new type of demonic spirit, okay? I'm not one to say, oh, there's, a, there's the tree devil and the sky devil and the cloud devil and the dirt devil. I, I, that's not me. You guys know my heart enough to know that that's, that's not me. So when I'm saying the spirit of Judas, I need you to understand what I am saying as versus what I'm not saying. What I'm not saying is that Judas's actual spirit is affecting us. What I am saying is that the same devil that inspired him to betray Jesus is still on the earth. And so the spirit that afflicted Judas has the capacity to at least attempt to afflict you and I. So when I'm referencing the spirit of Judas, I'm referencing the demonic entities that encouraged him and influenced him to betray the Lord. Does that make sense? I'm not saying that Judas came up from hell and is messing with you. See, if Jesus had that type of influence in his small circle of 12, it is not inconceivable to suspect that he can or has done the same in any group of believers. Y'all catch that? If one of the 12 was influenced by the devil, then it stands to reason in a group this size, we probably have more than one. You catch what I'm saying? I'm not casting stones. I'm saying we got, we got to be aware. Back in the 80s, I used to listen to some some uh, Christian rock bands, uh, White Cross, um, Petra, Little Striper, Newsboys. I don't think Newsboys are really rock, though. So one of the songs that Petra did, now listen, Petra's not the same group since Greg X. Volds moved on and we got Mr. Slit. Um I'm, I'm a Greg X. Volds guy. So um, what's the name of the album that had the, the spaceship on it? More Power To You. So on, I think it's on that album, there was a song entitled Judas Kiss. Anybody know that song? Who's never heard Petra's song Judas Kiss? <laughs> no, I'm not going to play it. So I'm going to give you some of the lyrics. It says, I wonder how it makes you feel when the prodigal won't come home. I wonder how it makes you feel when he'd rather be on his own. I wonder what it's like for you when a lamb has gone astray. 
I wonder what it's like for you when your children disobey. It must be like another thorn struck in your brow. It must be like another close friend's broken vow. It must be like another nail right through your wrist. It must be just like Judas' kiss. He says, I wonder how it makes you feel when no one seeks your face. I wonder how it makes you feel when they give up in the race. I wonder what it's like for you when they willingly disobey. And I wonder what it's like for you when they willingly walk away. I think so often our perspective is, how does this affect me? And I'm not saying that that's a wrong perspective. I'm saying many times that's a one-sided perspective. Because we think, well, I can't do this or it's going to disappoint God, so I, I'm going to be without the ability to enjoy this thing or this vice or this game or this movie or this whatever, this relationship. And so we're all negative on the fact that we're missing out. And I wonder what God's thinking on the other side. He's saying, you're upset that you get me instead of that. You're upset that you're not, ta or that you are taking life and joy and peace and freedom, and you're you're mad. I'm your second choice. So let me ask you a simple question: Does the Judas spirit have its sights set on you? <laughs> I want to say a. A hearty yes. In Psalm 41, verse 4, right in the middle of the book, Psalm 41, verse 4, it says, I said, have mercy on me, Lord. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? When one of them comes to see me, he speaks falsely while his heart gathers slander. And then he goes out and he spreads it around. All my enemies whisper together against me. They imagine the worst for me, saying, a vile disease has afflicted him. He will never get up from the place where he lies. Look at verse 9. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. Listen to that same verse, verse 9 in the Amplified. Even my own close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me, betraying me. Everybody who's been in church for any length of time knows that Judas committed the ultimate betrayal because he betrayed Jesus, handing him over to his enemies and effectively causing him to be crucified. Now, we understand that that really was God's plan all along. However, that does not make Judas innocent. Judas made that decision of his own free will. God did not force him to do so. So I want to talk for just a little while today about how to recognize the spirit of Judas when it shows up in your life. Because it will. It will. What I'm about to get into is especially important for anyone who's in or who's called to any type of ministry. This is probably a message I'd preach to ministers. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, it says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And in the Amplified, it says, That sword is of division between belief and unbelief. And I love that distinction. 
For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household when one believes and another one does not. Here's what Jesus is saying. Look, I am a divisive character. Listen, I, I don't purport to put myself in Jesus' shoes, but let me say it like this. There are people that if you tell them that you love Joel, they will cease to be your friend. I'm just telling it's just the way it is. And so Jesus is saying, if I'm going to be in your life, there are people that will not stay in your life because you associate with me. Can I get real practical? I'm telling you, this is a weird anointing I'm feeling today. I, I don't know that I've felt this one quite like this before. When Todd Bentley came to our church, I was warned by other ministers. Now listen, Todd's got a lot of stuff in his history. You better do your homework. I wouldn't be letting that man fill your pulpit, blah, 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 blah. So I, I told you when this happened, I did my due diligence. Not only did I call and talk to him, and if he was unwilling to answer my questions, I was going to be done anyway. But he willingly gave me the phone numbers of the men that took him through restoration. So I got them on the phone. What happened? What did he say? What did he do? How did he respond? How long did this take? I mean, I, <laughs> I'm needling them. Right? Not to be mean, but again, whoever I let in the pulpit has got my stamp. And so if nonsense comes from the pulpit, that's on me. You hear what I'm saying? So I'm doing my due diligence and homework, right? Prayed about it, asked the Lord about it. I did not get a knot. I got total peace over the thing. And I said, okay, listen, anybody could be restored. Have you looked? Have you read the story about David? I mean, have you really read? Here's something else I don't understand. Why in ministry do we only want people that have never sinned? My Bible says, he who's been forgiven much loves much. Now, I'm not asking for a fight, and I'm not asking for a big rip in our relationship, but I'm going to tell you, even when in relationships, when I've had rips, many times those rips heal stronger than they were before the rip. I remember years ago when I was a single guy and Cameron and I got into it pretty heavy in our apartment. Did I tell you that one? Only time we came to blows. And uh, no, second time because we met in a fist fight. So it was a second time. So we found ourselves in the living room and I'm towed up just like this. My hand is cocked. My fist is ready to go. And he's just like that on the other side. And we looked at each other. Both of our heads kind of cocked like you knew we were both considering, are we going to do this? And so we made an agreement that day and said, there's nobody on this planet that's worth splitting our relationship. Just not. And in fact, if we find somebody who's trying to tear us apart, we both agreed to kick them to the curb. We were best buds for over 31 years, so that agreement worked. You hear anything I'm saying? So what was very tumultuous and almost a rip healed up between us, and we were stronger than we ever were. So when somebody says, I just can't believe, you know, so-and-so, they be lying on me and said, listen, some of it's malicious, but not all the time is it malicious. Sometimes they believe what they're saying until they find out that they were wrong, and then when they find out they're wrong, they say, Cindy, I'm so sorry. I really thought that was the truth about you. Now I find out, you know how many people have come back into my life years later and said, I avoided you. I, I blasted your reputation. I was, I was mean and vindictive because I believed what I found out now is not true about you. And I just want to tell you, 10, 15, 20 years later, I'm sorry. You catch what I'm saying? So 
when you have relationships that have stood the test of time, honor them. You say, well, why, why would I want to do that? What if the new person is going to be better? Listen, I would rather trust the walk and relationship with somebody that's walked with me for 10, 15, 20 years than to risk losing a 20-year relationship over the odds that the next one might be as good or better than that one. You honor what you've built. Because watch this. If you can't honor what you've built with this one, how in the world can they expect you to honor the new? This is what, this is what gets me about people that, that cheated on their, on their spouse and got a divorce, and now they want to go marry the one they cheated with. And I'm like, how do you stand before God and say that you will honor them, love them, cherish them, be faithful only unto them as long as you both shall live when you know the only reason you got to this platform in the first place is because you violated that very oath to the first one? You catch what I'm saying? So you have to have a loyalty in your heart to the ones that have been loyal to you. Are they imperfect? Yes. Do they mess up? Yes. Do they hurt you? Yes. Are they worth it? Yes. So Jesus is saying, if you're going to walk in a relationship with me, it's probably going to cause a problem and a split in your house. Your parents ain't going to like it. Your brothers and sisters ain't going to like it. Your granddaddy ain't going to like it. Because those that say yes to Jesus have to divorce themselves from everybody who's not. When I married Rachel, I necessarily divorced every other relationship in my life other than her. It's God first and then my wife. And as much as I love my kids, my relationship with my wife comes before my kids. My kids better never tell me it's me or her. You're going to lose. You hear what I'm saying? And that's what God is saying. I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring division between those that believe me and those that function in unbelief. Even in the public arena, I'm not going to mention locations or specifics because I'm praying they show up. But even when I tell the truth about Jesus, he's still healing, delivering, mending, restoring, raising people from the dead, healing diseases, healing mental illness, removing addictions. He's still doing that stuff. And then I'm told, no, we live in a fallen world. How do you think you got salvation in a fallen world? If, he, if, we, if you got salvation in a fallen world, then all the stuff that salvation means, so-so, means all this other stuff, right? So that's why... There are some people that are never going to jive with you. If you don't like my wife, stay away from me. If you disrespect my wife, know that I'm coming. Know that I'm coming. So get this. As passionate as I am about that, about my wife, please don't be lying on my God. Please don't be misrepresenting Jesus. Please don't tell me that he is the antithesis of what his character and his word say about who he is. Do you see where I'm at? <laughs> see, some of y'all thought this Jesus thing was all love and peace and joy and no, it's hell. It's a fight for your life. It's a fight or die. Judas will always show up if he's not already there. And he's going to try to get in your inner circle. So it's not uncommon for Judas to show up at work, among your friends, in church, or even in your own household. What I mean by household, 
I mean anyone who lives in your house or anyone you let live in your house. So part of how the spirit of Judas lands such a direct hit is he shows up unexpectedly. Now, now listen, if we're just fun and about, and you know how we guys are sometimes, you know, and all of a sudden you, you smack me in the face. You got me. You ain't going to get me again, but you got me. Why? Because you got me by surprise. How do you suppose the enemy gets access into our life? By surprise. Caught us unaware. See, when we come to church, many times our guard is down. Why? We're at church. These people love me. What happens when a predator shows up at church? Why do you think we have people on security? Why do you think we have people watching the parking lot and watching the, the hallways? And why? Because not everybody that looks like a Christian and walks like a Christian and smells like a Christian and says Christian words really is. Can Jesus redeem everybody? Yes. I got on to somebody in the last couple of weeks that indicated they, they invited somebody that had a, let's just say, a legal past with kids. And I said, that is a necessary for me to know. Not because I want to pinpoint them or, or, or beat up on them or make them feel bad or anything else, but you need to know I'm going to have one eye on them and one eye on the rest of everybody. Why? Because I don't know where they're at with Jesus. And not everybody that says, oh, I've been delivered has. Uh, I don't think you guys get this yet. I take this role serious. Serious. I will do whatever it takes to see to it that you're protected, that you're covered that you're blessed, that you're encouraged, even if I have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in the parking lot with a mob. You understand what I'm saying? I take this serious. I find out somebody's been laying hands on you. I may have to find out if No Excuses has a, a bail ministry. Y'all don't. It's okay. Y'all don't know. It's all good. I feel that way even spiritually because I see so much manipulation. Well, I'm anointed. Well, I'm called to pray. Well, I'm called to prophesy. Might be. Don't mean you're called here. I'd be like somebody walking in and said, I'm called to preach. And so they just walk up while I'm preaching, get behind a pulpit and start their own. Oh, you understood that. You catch what I'm saying? So we're watching constantly to beat off the wolves, to protect the sheep, and encourage those that are going a different direction, pursuing the things of God, Right? to encourage them in that way. Not everybody is called to the five-fold ministry, and that's okay. Man, if you're called to helps, if you're called to administrations, if you're called for cleaning, if you're called for, we need all of, called for cooking, glory to God. <laughs> ministry is varied. So this unexpected stuff is how they typically try to infiltrate inner circles. And they'll show up saying, I just want to help. Now, I can talk about this one because we've totally cut it out. But I've had, over the years, multiple people walk up. First time here, second time, third time. Hey, I just want you to know, I have an anointing for music, and I'm called to lead worship, and I understand you ain't got nothing going on up in here. So I'm just going to tell you, I'm here. So you just go ahead and put me up there, and I'm going to, I'm going to lead the worship. 
<laughs> it's like slow your roll. <laughs> slow, slow, slow your roll. Mm. No. No. He said, well, well, how is that? Why is that? I'm going to tell you, any true minister of God understands to be greatest in the kingdom, you've got to be a servant of all. So anybody who comes in, da, 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 I'm this and I'm that and I'm called to this and I got that and my anointing is this and so and so laid hands on me. And, eh, next. You see what I'm saying? Because when, when somebody comes in and their love is what's seen and their love is what ex, is, is expressed, they're serving Jesus was the one that said, you want to be great in the kingdom? Serve everybody. Can I tell you another? I'm going to anyway. When, when new people come in and they're making a beeline for me or for Rachel or for people that they perceive is in our inner circle, that is such a red flag. That is such a red flag. He might as well see me on the street, walk up next to me, just grab my hand and try to walk hand to hand with me down the road. That's, that's how off that is. You catch what I'm saying? <laughs> Some of y'all are nodding, but I can see in your eyes you ain't getting it yet. It's all right. We're going to get there. One minute, somebody's there offering all sorts of help. They say, hey, let me help you with your finances. They don't know you from Adam. They want your books. All of a sudden, they, they invite themselves to go eat with you. They greet you with a holy kiss like they've known you for 15 years. They're acting like a longtime friend, pretending to be somebody that they're not. And pretending, possibly, to be offended that they're not included in your plans or conversations. Now listen, I encourage fellowship. If you've been around this house any time, for any length of time, you know I encourage fellowship, right? And if you don't know anybody here, and you want to get to know people, and you don't know how to do it, and after church you hear people saying, hey, where, 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 where do you want to go to? You want Taco Bueno? What you want to do? You want to go down to Pickles Buffet? Or, uh, oh, you want to run down here? To the, yeah, let's go down here and have some Earl's Barbecue. That'd be really great. And there's a guest there that, that we don't know, so we're overlooking them, and if they say, well, I don't know y'all, but I'd, I'd kind of like to get to know you. Would it be all right if I, if I tagged along? That's brilliant. But you know what we ought to be doing? We ought to be seeing people that look like they don't fit and go and say, hey, we're going down to Earl's. You want to go with us? All of a sudden, it makes, oh, takes a load off. But either way it happens, it needs to happen, right? Because what's going to happen? You guys are going to go eat with them, and you're going to find out whether or not you feel good about them in your spirit or mm, not so sure about that. And so you might be calling me up and say, listen, these people are the bomb diggity. You need to be talking to them. They are so, or you might be saying, listen, now, there was some stuff come out their mouth at the table. They said Jesus, but it wasn't always. And you say, well, that, that just seems wrong, does it? If I know somebody has got a history of being a dating predator and I see them hanging out with you, you want me to not come tell you? Huh? Oh, I get it. You just wanted it one way. I told her, I got, no, it doesn't work that way. Family's family. And if I see you getting led down the road by the nose, I'm going to say, listen, snap out of it. Oh, but they're just so, wake up. You know what drives me crazy? Sometimes I got to say stuff to some of you that your parents should have been the ones to tell you. I'm serious. And for all you parents that think you can't tell your kids how to do right because they know in your life you did wrong, shame on you. Not for doing wrong, but for, making, for not making sure that they don't go down the same road you do out of guilt. If you got free from it, then be free from it and snatch them by the back of the head and make them do what they need to do is right. Yeah. 
So they show up. They don't know you, but they act like a long-lost friend. And once they get involved and to find out some information, hey, where, where, where do you live? Where do you work? What do you drive? How much do you make? Who do you know? That's not first dinner material. Huh? And so the next minute they're getting this information and they wind up betraying that vital information about you to your enemies. And you go, well, we're not supposed to have enemies. Oh, yes, we are. Oh, yes, we are. Anybody who's against Jesus is against me. Y'all hear what I'm saying? When David and Jonathan made covenant and they swapped clothes and swords and did the blood brother thing and killed the animal, walked to the entrails, blood squishing between their toes and all that stuff, and they met in the middle and said, listen, my enemies are now your enemies and your friends are now my friends and my stuff is your stuff. and That's covenant relationship. So if somebody came, against, came to war against Jonathan, David was going to be in that war. Guys, we can't be walking around at a restaurant and out of a parking lot. Somebody walk up and pick a fight with you that's not going to include me. You understand that? It, it ain't going to happen. Why? Because we're in relationship. He said, well, that's not fair. That's right. I ain't going to fight fair. I'm going to fight to win. Y'all, like, am I talking too practical for y'all? Is this not spiritual? Are you, are you, are you, are you scrambling a little bit that I'm not you know, blowing bubbles and feel good. and So you got to beware, especially in these times of people acting overly helpful. Why? Because there's an enemy that wants to take you out. They want to hinder your progress of the Lord. And that's why everybody in this room and that belongs to this house or ministry needs to engage their discernment. You have a responsibility for discernment. Listen, I saw, I'm not a rat fan, okay? Rodents with a long time, I, I, I don't like rats. And uh, how many ever seen those big sticky mats so I saw a video clip where there was a, like a sewer pipe and these rats were coming in and out. So they put this big sticky mat. And so the first rat comes out there, he looks, and goes, this is a little weird, I don't know. I'm going to just run over there and, oh, and he gets stuck and he starts squealing. So the, I understand the first rat. He didn't know, never seen a sticky mat before. But when that next stupid rat shows up and sees his friend gasping for air and stuck to the mat and he goes, oh, it might have stuck to you, but it ain't going to stick to me. And John, that, there's something wrong with that. No discernment in the rat family. You understand what I'm saying? So now you got 15 rats that are all squealing and trying to get loose, and the, the 16th one shows up and says, what y'all doing? And jumps right out in the middle of it again. No discernment. And you go, that's kind of funny. Well, it's funny until it's real life. You get one Yahoo coming in here, rolling and smoking joints and thinking they're all cool, and the other one's wanting to be like them because they think they're cool, and they don't understand what's going to happen when they start that. I had somebody on the phone just the other day, just the last two or three days, try to convince me. I love Jesus, but I smoke weed. Is that okay, Pastor Joel? And then expletives and all kinds of nonsense and everything followed, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, man, you got to be kidding me. I can just hear some of y'all saying, so you're saying that it's wrong, even I'm taking it for legitimate reasons. And listen, if you got to justify, here's the deal. If it offends your conscience, don't do it. If it doesn't offend your conscience, don't wave a flag to others that it will. I think that's pretty fair, don't you? Some of y'all looking at me real holy right now. (laughs) 
Sunday, I read scripture about how the people of Moab sent their women to infiltrate Israel by sleeping and marrying the Israeli men. The enemy does not always fight from the outside. He's devised Trojan horses so that you and I would readily readily receive what appears to be a good gift for the purpose of destroying us from the inside. Guys, that's why I've had people that went to yard sales, bought stuff, brought it home, had all kinds of demonic activity going on in their house, and they couldn't understand why. Because you brought what was an idol to somebody else into your house that had demonic attachments, and it let that thing run free in your house, and you didn't know. I've had people bring garbage sacks full of paraphernalia. I mean, bongs, pipes, syringes, books, magazines, um, pentagrams, charms, you name it. I nearly destroyed a fire pit out in the parking lot just going through three sacks of stuff with just melted plastic and just, just bleh, right? He said, why did you just throw it away? Because it would have found its way into somebody else's hands, into somebody else's house, and so I want to destroy it. Y'all, you hear what I'm saying? This is what we have to do with the works of the enemy. We have to destroy it. Yes, I am. This is why Israel right now has to finish off, what is it, Hamas? Has to finish them. Why? Because if there's a remnant, they're just going to grow back and come at them again to destroy more people. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of proof. That's why when you see, that's why there's no such thing as a little sin. Lord, I got rid of all that stuff. Just this one thing, Lord. That one thing going to have babies. It's going to happen. Now more than ever, we have to know who we can and cannot trust. You have to know. Judas's true nature wasn't revealed until the time of the Lord's end on earth, the end of Jesus' life. That's when Judas raised his head. Now, watch this. Judas was picked by Jesus. Judas was a trusted apostle. Judas handled the money. Judas hung out with the apostles and with Jesus. Judas was one of only 12. And yet there was betrayal in their midst. I'm a big proponent of dating long. See them when they're mad, they're happy. They're sad, they're quiet, they're loud, they're rambunctious, they're happy, they're goofy. See them with or without makeup. Serious. See them when they're dressed up and when they're dressed down. See how they handle money. See how they handle people. And all y'all that have been down the road are going, pfft. How much more so in ministry, in the house of God, with the things of God? I know of people right now that are handing out minister certificates and ordination papers like candy. Just give me X amount of money, take X amount of classes, and if you complete those classes, we're going to stamp you. I don't want to be in their shoes come time to stand before God. Paul's school was based on relationship, not on how many courses you passed. Know them that labor among you. Know them, not know of them. Know them. You know how many people saddling up next to a minister in order to get credentialed just so they can bounce? Bounce. 
Listen, guys, when I'm in relationships, especially in ministry, I'm in for the long haul. I'm in until Jesus comes. Which means I want somebody who's got an address that I know where it's at, vehicle that I know what they drive, phone number that they don't change every time they're trying to get rid of somebody. Some of you change your cell phone numbers more than you change your underwear, and I need to understand why. You hear what I'm saying? Who are you running from? We got to fix that. So Judas will typically show up when it's time for a promotion or an important season in your life. And they're going to act like a friend, and they're going to offer all kinds of help, but the truth is they're there to help themselves at your expense. Judas was not traveling with the apostles to help them. He was traveling with them to help him. A lot of times, Judas will show up at the end of somebody's life. You've seen this in the news with, with wealthy people. You got some 95-year-old guy who you know is going to kick the bucket in about six months, and he's marrying some 24-year-old supermodel. Why? She's banking on the fact he got six months or less. A Judas at the end of his life. Y'all hear anything I'm saying? See, the dictionary defines betrayal as the act of delivering or exposing to an enemy by treachery or disloyalty to be unfaithful in guarding, maintaining, or fulfilling, to violate a confidence by revealing or disclosing in violation of confidence. Can I, can I say something about that betrayal too? Be very careful who you tell what about you. I'm seeing this happen all over the place. And people want to be known. That is a natural desire in people. They want to be known. But there's some things about your life that don't need to be known. It needs to stay covered by the blood of Jesus that you got set free from and forgiven for doing that nonsense. You don't need to go dig it up to let them know who you are because that's not who you are. You hear anything I'm saying? So there's certain things that you should not be telling anybody. You can tell God. You can tell your spouse. On certain occasions, Tell your kids. But that's it. If you rode with Frank and Jesse, keep it to yourself. I'm serious. There are people that want to use your history. Watch the history you got forgiven from, healed from, delivered from, set free from. They want to use that history. They want to go fishing in the blood of Jesus to hook something out and remind you of your history to prevent you from obeying God and to divide you from those that are. Stop telling people you're junk. And stop telling people other people's junk. If somebody trusted you enough to expose their heart to you, don't take a snapshot. Say, Did you see this? Oh, my gosh. Did you look? Oh, my goodness. Don't do that to them. Honor them. Sometimes, listen, there's been a number of people who's come to my office, see me in private, whatever, and they've done that. They've exposed it. You know what I have to do with that? As soon as they hand me the picture of their history, and I throw it in the blood of Jesus, because I don't want to go home with that either. If you needed to unload, fine. I'm your pack mule. But as soon as you leave, I'm unloading it too. And that's why sometimes people go, now you remember I told you about that one? Uh, did you? And it's not because I'm disinterested. It's because the Lord is protecting me so that my mind is not consumed with that when I've got to pray for you and love you and go to the hospital room with you and, and help you with family issues and dig you out of holes. And God doesn't want that on my mind about you. If he's forgiven it and covered it, why should, I, why should I carry that? Do you see what I'm saying? Even to the point that when I release words, people come, hey, hey can you give me that word again that you, you know, six months ago you prophesied over me and told me? Dude, if you didn't catch me six seconds after that word, I'm probably not going to remember it. You want to know why? Because it wasn't for me. I was just a delivery guy. It wasn't, I didn't memorize it before I gave it to you. The Lord said it. I released it. That's like being on the phone. Now, how much is that? Two cups, of, two cups of flour, four eggs. All I'm doing is repeating what I'm being told on the phone. That's what prophecy is. Amen. 
It is a blessing that God gives me forgetfulness as it relates to people and their sins and their mess. and their. I don't want that on my heart or mind when I'm dealing with you. I want to be able to love you. Some of you are like, I don't know if I should clap or smile or not. I don't know what to do. Let me just ask this. How many of you right now are up for a promotion at work? Okay. How many of you know in the spirit realm that you're about to switch seasons? So every one of you are a Judas magnet. Watch this. Jesus couldn't graduate to fulfill what God had told him to do until Judas showed up. And there's certain things that you cannot access until your Judas shows up. But that doesn't mean that you have to fall prey for his vices and schemes. Jesus didn't fall prey. He said, what you have to do, go get it done. Do it fast. We've got to start using our Judases instead of being surprised by them. This church is coming into a new season. So my radar is up for Judas's. We're about to need a bigger facility. My radar is up for Judas's. Y'all ain't hearing anything I'm saying. See, true betrayal can only happen when first there was a closeness or intimacy between two people. I'm going to say that's partially true. Because sometimes somebody will come into your life for no other reason than to get some information to go spill the beans. It had nothing to do with the fact they wanted to be close to you as far as being tight. They got close to you as far as proximity so they could overhear what you're saying. Here's some traits to help you recognize somebody with a Judas spirit. Judas will always show up within your inner circle or trying to get into your inner circle. He or she will infiltrate that circle to get close to you to plan their attack. See, some of y'all have a false sense of security. Well, I ain't no Judas get in here because I know these people. Well, Jesus knew the 12, but that spirit still got a hold of Judas. (sighs) Judas is a liar. That's another trait, and he'll lie straight to your face. I didn't say that. That that is not my heart. You don't know my heart. How many ever heard that? I can't believe you're saying that to me. After all we've been through. Betrayal wouldn't really be betrayal if they didn't have access, now would it? Judas will lie to you about what other people are saying about you. And then lie to them saying that you're saying this or that about them when you're not. So meanwhile, you got people walking around and they've stopped talking to you. Ooh, I'm going to meddle now. If you got people that you would always high five, fist bump, hug, what's up, how you doing, we got to get together, get some coffee. And that's been the norm the whole time you've known them. And all of a sudden, you walk in, they walk in, and they're... It's a flag. If you're used to getting a text message from them two or three times a day, and all of a sudden two or three months have gone by, you ain't heard bupkis from them, that's a sign. And you know what most people do? I just don't know why they treat me so bad, and all I've tried to do is just love them, be kind and generous. and you, 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 You go internal. You know what you need to do? I can come in or you can come out, but we're going to fix this. That's what relationship really is. Do you understand that? Relationship is not so fragile that if you sneeze, Humpty Dumpty's going to fall. Relationship is, listen, I'm sick and tired of being ignored by you. It's been going on for three weeks, right? 
So we can do this the easy way or the hard way. So you pick it. That's relationship that says, I care enough about you. I won't stick to you like ugly on neighbor. You going to tell me what's up? Make it easy on you. You hear what I'm saying? That's what real relationship is about. Most people don't have real relationships. But you know, he ain't been talking to me for three weeks. I don't even know. He's got some bug up his rear end. I don't even know what's going on with him. But I, has he been treating you that way too? Do you see, what, you see what's happening? So why in the world would I want to get Sam involved? I just need to go to him. Just tell me what I said. Tell me what I did. If I'm wrong, I'm going to apologize. But if I'm not wrong, you go going to apologize because we're fixing this. That's relationship. And then he finally said, well, you know, Sam done said that you said this about me and it just hurt my feelings. Well, first of all, I didn't say that. Come here. Sam, he said, you said, I said. Oh, oh, that's not what I meant. I didn't mean that's not. Did you understand? That's not what I. So all this is going on. Why? Because we allowed a spirit to infiltrate a relationship. Our battle's not with flesh and blood. But I'm going to spank that spirit that's using you. You, you, you. you catch what I'm saying? My battle's not with Sam. My battle's not with Nick. But if the enemy is bending either one of them, I'm not going to know if I'm not asking questions and using my relationship. I'm so tired of, of relationships being ripped and destroyed because somebody didn't have enough guts to walk up to who they said was a friend and say, help me understand. We a three text a day friend for the last 15 years. Now we a no text friend. What's up? You lose my number? You say, well, that's not real spiritual, isn't it? You know how much nonsense would stop in the spiritual realm if we just learned how to address it in the natural and find out what's going on so we could stomp the devil instead of our people, instead of our own feelings? Some of y'all sitting in this room acting real holy right now. You've been upset at me for the longest time. You've been looking for a reason to, 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 to stick me because somebody told you. Did you hear that message? You know that was all about you, what he was saying in that message. You, you know. <laughs> huh? You know how many times people got hurt feelings at me because they thought somebody came and told me about their situation because of a message I preached? <laughs> I, th- listen, not once, not twice, not th- I'm talking a bunch of times. They got all upset and said, I ain't even coming back. Why aren't you coming back? Because I'm sick of you preaching about my stuff. What are you talking about? Huh? I'm sorry. You wanted to go someplace where they didn't know nothing, didn't hear nothing, didn't preach nothing, didn't carry nothing, didn't release nothing. There's plenty of them. So he'll look for your inner circle. He's a liar. The spirit loves to pit one side against the other. I want want you to understand this. Judas does not mind destroying relationships because he wants to gain from both sides. That's like I'm a paint and body guy. And I see two of my friends about to have a collision. I say nothing because I know I'm going to get both their business. You hear what I'm saying? There are people watching and going, you know what? I I really like Joseph and and Nicholas, but they're so tight, they ain't got no time for me. But I bet if I cause a little ripple and split them up, then they'd both have time for me, and I get to be in a relationship with both of them. And there's people that think that way. So their job is to so be a Judas in your life I'm so sorry he's being such a jerk to you and saying them not bad things, but I'm going to tell you what, I, you and me, we, we tied. I'm so sorry he's being such a jerk to you. Oh, my goodness. Can you believe the nonsense came out? Of, we're just going to leave him alone, okay? But really, I'm hanging out with him half the week and him half the week. And See, some of, y'all, some, of y'all, some of y'all looking like, you scared to death to look at me, afraid I'm going to know something. I already know. I 
That's why so many people sit at the back. Just kidding. <laughs> that was free. That was free. So he's a liar. He's also greedy. That's why he wanted the treasurer's position. So he could skim the offerings. Listen, this is literally on workforce.com. Listen to this. Employees who feel undercompensated or unrecognized for their work sometimes respond by a self-devised bonus plan. That means they steal because you ain't paying them enough. Huh? He felt like he wasn't being compensated for whatever work he did or not recognized enough. Or was it brought in at an elevated position due to past experience or status from somewhere else? So he just set up a little skimming operation and started taking what he wanted, all the while acting submitted, helpful, and devoted. I'm going to put this in church terms because this, this stuff is happening, okay? I've had people walk into this house and try to tell me, well, so-and-so laid hands on me, and I carry such and such anointing, and I'm called to do this, that, and the other, and blah, 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 blah. And so if, if I don't elevate them where they think they need to be elevated or honored, where they think they need to be honored, then what they start doing is they start getting a little bit farther away from me. What they do is they're saying, hey, you want to do a Bible study? Let's go down to a coffee shop, just, just us. We're just going to do a Bible study. And they, they wind up starting to, to get their own pulling from the house. So that's why I have to say stuff publicly because if I don't say so publicly, you're going to think that what's going on is holy and righteous and just, and it's from the house, so it must be good. And just because it's people that came from the house doesn't mean that it, it carries the insignia. It doesn't mean that it carries the fingerprint. It doesn't mean that it carries the heart condition. It doesn't mean that it carries the, the care and concern and the love and the protection. You see what I'm saying? I'm sorry, was that a little too straight for you? Do I need to dilute that just a little bit, or you you get what I'm saying? Judas is a sneaky little booger. He's a thief. The whole reason that Judas protested about the lavish perfume that Mary had, that she broke open for Jesus, he was angry that the perfume wasn't sold to put more money in the bag for him to skim. Had nothing to do with the poor. Judas is jealous. He's jealous of others' positions, their influence, their friends, their acceptance, their trust. Listen, there's people that their whole reason for living is to ride the wave of discontent. Well, the pastor knew what kind of, what kind of person Kenny was. He kicked him to the curb and bring me into, the, into that, that position. Th- this happens constantly, Right? So people, you know, why, why in the world he picked them out to come pray for people? Pfft, what am I, chopped liver? I mean, I carry something, you know what I mean? Oh, you carry something. On that we agree. You hear, you hear anything I'm telling you? Guys, this is rampant. If it's gotten to a point that I got to preach over the pulpit, it's proliferated. I might as well, I could also call this the predator spirit. Judas is looking for whom he may deceive, devour, consume, confuse, irritate, divide. (laughs) The look on some of your faces. Judas is the very essence of betrayal. Mark 14, 10, and Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priest to betray him unto them. Judas will betray confidential and intimate knowledge about you to your enemies. If I'm trying to hang out with Nick... And I, my wedge has not worked with him and Joseph. But I know some dirt on Joseph. I know something about him you probably didn't know. If you knew who you was hanging with, you might not want to be hanging with him. So what you think about this? Watch. Divulging, confidential, private, covered information in an effort to divide a relationship. That's Judas. Oh, yes, Lord, I am going to say that. So many people 
Well, I'm called to minister. Fine, then minister. Well, I'm not being recognized here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce. I'm going to go someplace where I am. Why do people that truly believe they carry a call, an anointing, and a gift feel like they have to ostracize themselves in order for God to use them? I'm going to tell you what. We are called to raise people up and send people out, and I'm willing to do both. You understand what I'm saying? So you got to catch this. If you're not sent out, you might be kicked out. But you want ministers that are seasoned, veterans in the faith, people of integrity, and that haven't bounced from 15 other churches when they're saying, God moved me, when really, oh, God moved them because the minister kicked them out and they found another place and got kicked out of there and found another place, got kicked out of there until finally they found a harbor with you. You hear what I'm saying? You don't hear this in many places, do you? Judas is underhanded and sneaky. He will show empathy, comfort, kindness, and generosity just to get your trust and access. He acts like he's doing one thing when really he has a completely different motive. Here's a personal favorite. Sometimes the cover story is they act like they're submitted to you or I just want to learn from you. I just want to be mentored by you. It's a lie to buy them time, time to learn about you so they can figure out a way to get what they want from you. You got to be careful when they start giving you platitudes and trying to build you up. And I just want to, I just want to be submitted. I just want to, just want to honor you. I just, I just want to learn from you. I just want to sit at your feet and absorb. And am I saying that? People that really believe that, that that can't be sincere? No, I'm saying Judas will use the sincerity of others to use that as cover to get in your life. Judas is discouraging towards the higher things of God like worship, giving, personal sacrifice, and generosity. In John chapter 12, verse 3, then Mary took a pound of very expensive perfume and pure uh, spikenard and poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas, one of his disciples, the one who was going to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? And now he said this not because he cared about the poor, for he had never cared about them. This is Bible, man. This is the Amplified Translation. But because he was a thief, and since then he had, he had the money box serving as a treasure for the 12 disciples, he used to pilfer what he put into it. Judas is full of conspiracies, trying to enlist other people in his plot, and he acts innocent and trustworthy. How many has ever confronted somebody to find out if there was a Judas thing going on and they got oh so offended? <gasps> really? You think I would do that? How many has ever heard? <laughs> Judas did that too. Matthew chapter 26, verse 20. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12 disciples, and as they were eating, he said, I assure you and most solemnly say to you that one of you is going to betray me. Can you imagine how that sounded to the other 11? Being deeply grieved and extremely distressed, each one of them began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus answered, He who has dipped his hand in the bowl with me as a pretense of friendship will betray me. The Son of Man is going to the cross just as it is written in Scripture of him. But woe, judgment is coming to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man to have never been born. And Judas, the betrayer, said, Surely it's not I, Rabbi. Acting just like the other 11. And Jesus said, You said it yourself. So Judas acted completely innocent. Innocent. 
I want you to hear that encounters with a Judas can not only change your life, but they can destroy your ministry or any hope of having one. Just ask anyone who's dated a Judas. Here's the warning signs. If you wanted to know if you're dealing with one, here it is. Just when the Lord started raising you up in ministry and exalting your anointing, you had a close friend that begins to act strange, less supportive, jealous, and even envious. There's a sign. When someone close to you or trying to get close to you is trying to infiltrate every part of your life, nothing private. They want to know everything about you. And they say, I'm only doing this because I want to help you. Sometimes to the point of being so forceful that you have to be abrupt to stop them. How about someone who's close to you or is trying to get close to you really hard and they're ferreting out personal information, especially financial information, that they have no reason to know. Stuff that is flat, none of their business. You don't need to know how many times they've been married. You don't need to know how many times they've been arrested. You don't need to know none of that stuff. If someone in your life feels like and voices that they're not being given enough, paid enough, paid enough, recognized enough, trusted enough, honored, respected. Judas never felt like he was getting enough, did he? That's why he became a thief. Listen to this one. If your gut feeling is telling you something's not right, pay attention. If nothing else raises a flag, but you get this weirdness in your belly, you go, mm, this just don't feel right. Walk away. If after being in their presence, your spirit feels dirty, that's God warning you that there's something demonic going on. Don't ignore that. In Mark 14, 45, and when Judas came, immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Rabbi, Master, and he kissed him forcefully. Let me, let me give you an understanding. Come here, Steve. I don't pick on you again. Hurry up. When did Judas come to kiss Jesus? Before or after he betrayed him? After. So before all this is going on, and today, where we're at today, it's like, man, how you doing? Kind of do this, one of these things, you know, kind of give the brother thing. Man, what's up? It's good to see you, right? That is the equivalent of the, of the kiss, the holy kiss that Judas did to Jesus. It was, hey, friend, right? So how many times you know somebody been talking about you, lying on you, trying to divide you, steal from you. You know that stuff is going on, right? And they walk up in the midst of mutual friends. Hey, man, what's up? And you're like, so, so in an effort to try to save themselves, oh, come on, man, you know, you, you know what's up, and, and act like everything's okay. So the Bible says that Judas had to forcefully kiss Jesus because I imagine when Jesus came, hey, Rabbi, went like this. I'm sure Jesus was like this. And he had to grab him and forcefully kiss him. Do you see what I'm saying? Thank you. So if you're hanging out with somebody and you see them being forced upon, pay attention. Somebody's trying to force themselves on you, pay attention. So what does the enemy gain by using a Judas-type spirit on you? I'm going to tell you one thing. He wants to get your emotions in an uproar. You want to know why? Because you don't make solid decisions when you're emotional. That's why you don't make emotional decisions on vehicles, houses, or people you date. I'm serious. Woo, look at this car. Wow, listen to that engine. Oh, my goodness. You don't know that they poured the thickest oil possible in there to stop it from knocking and rattling, right? And your belly is going, mm, I don't know about this, but you are so in love. The interior. Oh, the new car smell. Look at the top. Oh, I love this car. And so you make an emotional purchase, and the next day, that rod's a knocking. 
Huh? We do that with relationships. Yeah, let's get together. Let's. Be careful who you make alliances with. The devil wants to destroy your ability to, tr to trust so that you can't have healthy relationships with other people or with God. Because many people that get their trust destroyed, somehow or another the enemy twists it to be God's fault. Well, if God was any kind of God, he would have protected you. He did. He sounded the alarm. He twisted your belly in a pretzel, and you were too stupid to pay attention to it. It's not God's fault. You did it. The devil also wants to harden your heart to get you into bitterness. So watch the timing. When it's time for you to be spiritually promoted, promoted on the job, relationship is really taking off and growing, when all the stuff seems to be going good, pay attention. The Judas will come at the end to qualify you for the next level. It's not if, it's when the Judas is going to show up. So what do you do when you find that you're being attacked by a Judas? Is this good practical information tonight? Are you into this? You paying attention? I got your attention. Number one, when you find you're dealing with a Judas spirit, you're going to have to break the soul tie with that person. Soul ties are not always from bad experiences. Sometimes soul ties are from good experiences. Let me explain. If you've been betrayed and hurt and wounded, of course, that person's name is mentioned, you're going to have a negative emotional response, and there's, there's an attachment that needs to be broken. But also, you might have been involved in a relationship, whether romantic or just platonic or whether it's a, a, you know, a business, whatever it is, and you're so enjoying it, but God says, get out of it because that's not what I have for you. And so you honored that and you got away from it, but your heart is still with them. That's an ungodly soul tie. doesn't mean that there was trauma in your life. It just means that that's not the one for you. This is good info. So just because you don't have any bad feelings or unforgiveness or bitterness or hate or anger towards them does not mean that that is not an ungodly soul tie. Well, what makes it ungodly? Not ordained by God. You say, well, how do you do that? I'm going to tell you how you do that. Number one, I, I pray that you're spirit-filled. But you say, Father, I submit this whole relationship and everything that happened with, with person X. I put that under the blood of Jesus today, and I nullify, cancel, and destroy every ungodly soul tied by the name of that person and myself. It ends now in the mighty name of Jesus. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you come in and fill every void, every crevice, or that you would absolutely heal men and restore that part of my life that has now been severed and make me more connected to you than I've ever been before. And if you've got to do that with 50 people or 5,000 people, whatever it takes. Number two, you're going to have to repent if needed. Look at how you've handled the end of this situation and repent if any of it was displeasing to the Lord. Watch this. God tells you to sever that relationship. You're mad at him. You're avoiding his house. You stop paying tithes. You stop praying. Oh, you obeyed him over there, but you're disobeying and everything else. You're still going to have to repent that your attitude is in the toilet because you did what God told you. Y'all ain't hear nothing I'm saying. Why well, about be sitting on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. That kind of attitude. God, get off my back about not being in the house. I broke that relationship because that's what you told me to do. He said, yeah, but I didn't tell you to stop going to church either. Some of y'all are still upset at God because you're not in relationship with the one or ones that you wanted to be in relationship with. And you're irritated because there's nobody in your own mind or heart that's equitable to the ones that you lost. And here's the problem. 
you're still bleeding from that wound, and God can't attach anything new to that until that's healed, and that can't get healed until you get God off the hook and you get your heart right about getting away from that because just because that looked like it was good, smelled like it was good, felt like it was good, tasted like it was good does not mean that it was not going to be poison in your life. So if God told you to get rid of it, it was for your benefit and his glory. So trust him. Number three. You don't just need to break the soul ties and repent of your own stuff. You need to forgive those that were Judas's in your life. And that's vitally important. As you're struggling to forgive those who hurt you, I want you to remember this statement. If you act like Judas... You let in a Judas spirit. One more time. If you act like Judas, you open the door and let in a Judas spirit. And you say, well, I don't know how that happens. Acting or pretending in some instances can open the doors to the demonic. I'm going to give you some, some public figures as an illustration. How many has ever heard of, of Zac Efron? Zac Efron played a serial killer, Ted Bundy, in the movie Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile. Sorry, missed, messed that up. He had difficulty separating himself from the role when he would go home after filming. He said, and I quote, it was almost impossible. I'd like to say that I did it successfully, but I couldn't, he told the Daily Mail. Co-star Lily Collins also had difficulty with her role in the film as Bundy's girlfriend, Elizabeth, but mostly during preparation for the movie rather than during filming. Isn't that just like the devil? He wants to get you and mess you up in private, but when you're in public, everything's okay. She said, I quote, I actually had an awful time in prep for it. I woke up every single night at 3 or 4 a.m. for a month. Isn't that interesting? I was woken with visions of destruction around rooms, logs, and broken glass. End quote. How many has ever heard of Leonardo DiCaprio? He called filming Shutter Island traumatic. He said it was one of the most intense, hardcore filming experiences I've ever had as we explored what the mentally ill had to face in the days when mental hospitals were called insane asylums. I went to places and unearthed unearthed some things that I did not think I was capable of. It was an emotional layer cake that just kept getting deeper and deeper. DiCaprio continued, quote, It took me back to the one time I really remembered my dreams because I usually don't. But when I used a nicotine patch when I was trying to quit smoking, I did have blood-curdling nightmares of mass murders, and I woke up in the middle of the night and had to take the patches off. I guess I had moments like that in the film. Daniel Day-Lewis shocked the world when he announced his retirement from acting in 2017. His final film, Phantom Thread, had reportedly engulfed him in such a depression that he would be prompted to publicly announce his retirement from acting, according to W Magazine. Paul, the film's director, and I laughed, he said, a lot before we made the movie, and then we stopped laughing because we were both overwhelmed by a sense of sadness, end quote. Day Lewis told the magazine, quote, that took us by surprise. Ooh, what did I say? Take you by what? That took us by surprise. We didn't realize what we had given birth to. It was, it was hard to live with and still is, end quote. If I know... Nicholas is mad at Joseph, and I act mad and angry to be close to him. Anger will consume me. If I see Latasha grieving over a, over a bad relationship, 
and I just want to get tight with Latasha, so I pretend to grieve like she's grieving. I open the door to grief and loss in my own life. You can't pretend to be something and then not be affected by the something you pretend to be. Number four. After you've done all these things, broke the soul ties, repented, and forgave them, you now have to let them go. You have to let them go. That means you have to cut off all contact between your life and theirs. Let me change the emphasis. You need to cut off all contact between them and you. It's real tough because sometimes Judas was somebody that we loved. But a snake is still a snake. Let me tell you another way that the enemy will get back in your life after you say you've cut them off. If you don't block their number, block their texts, and block their social media, then that's an open door for that Judas spirit to come back in and try to reignite soul ties. When you're checking their social media, the soul tie stays in place, and that means the, the demons still have access to your life. So when you walk away, you've got to walk away completely. When you give yourself to your husband or wife, you've got to give yourself completely. And if I'm giving myself completely to my wife, that means completely, not I still got this access. Y'all ain't hearing nothing I'm saying. So you say, Joel, it's getting rather thick in here. Please give me some, some hopium somewhere. Repeatedly, the Scripture says he wants us to have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. I can give you all this information, but if you're not open to the Holy Spirit confirming and affirming what I'm saying, then all you did was get a little head knowledge that will probably leak out in the parking lot. You're going to have to have some willingness to trust God and not your own understanding like we know in Proverbs chapter 3. Deliverance is not a one-time event any more than a shower is. So when you find yourself rethinking old ways, old habits, old relationships, you need to repent again. Why? Because you thought it again. You gave it access to your head again. It, it, it invigorated some emotions again. If you're taking notes, write this down. You will become what you tolerate. You will become what you tolerate. Jesus said, if they did it to me, they're going to do it to you. If there was a Judas in my life, there's going to be at least one Judas in your life. Here's the thing about Judas. When he's finished with his purpose with you, he moves to destroy you. Why? He doesn't want any loose ends. And then once you're destroyed, he finds a new victim. That's the cycle. Too often people in church have a false sense of security, just like Eve did with the apple. Just like Judas was able to steal from Jesus and still have communion and relationship with him for a season. But in the end, there's always death. On social media, I wrote this, so I'm going to say this to close, and then I'm going to pray for you. One of the problems with seeing issues in other people is that we must be more mindful that what problems we see in others can be an indication that it's also our issue. We see evidence of this with King David in 2 Samuel 12 when the prophet Nathan had to call him out on his sin that David thought was somebody else's. See, it's easy for us having Scripture to criticize and have no mercy for Judas. But could that be an indication that we have some of the same tendencies that he had? Are we also betraying Jesus? I 
Would I rather have taught or preached a shouting, romping, tooting, hollering, celebrating message tonight? I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to say messages like this are not necessarily easy, but they're necessary. I don't always like to take my vitamins, but they're necessary. I don't always like to exercise, but it's necessary. I don't always like to go to bed, but it's necessary. I don't always like to go to work, but it's necessary. I don't always like to pray, but it's necessary. Pastors have many roles. There's some parts of me that just missed the days when all I did was prophesy over people. As a pastor, we're, we're overseers, protectors, teachers, disciplinarians, counselors, encouragers. Not all of these roles are fun and enjoyable. Sometimes it can even be painful, but it's necessary. I'm telling you to watch out for Judas's because I know they're present. Don't be the one that comes up to me tonight. Hey, pastor, is it me? Is it me? Don't do that. Don't do that. They're present. So I'm saying don't walk around like you don't have a care in the world and like everybody's your friend. They're not. Cut off the flow of information you be giving people that you don't know too well and see how long that relationship lasts. You know, leeches don't suck on dead people. They suck where there's fresh blood. Cut off the blood supply, lose the leech. In some ways, my heart goes out to you first timers. They're thinking, my God, what did I walk into? <laughs> but on the other hand, I don't believe that you're here by coincidence on the night that you're here. I don't even, what's your name? Yeah, what's your name? Katera? Have I met you before? All right, forgive me. About three quarters of the way through the message, when I was over there, I looked back, I caught eyes with you, and I'm telling you right now, there are Judases in your life now, right now. And you know it. Don't want to see it. Don't want to believe it. But they're there. And we can get all upset about that. Oh, no, I got a dagger. Oh, my goodness, Judas is out of what? Listen, Judas is only come when it's time for promotion. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's like saying, you know, you loathe the final exam, but you want the diploma. If you want the diploma, you got to take the final exam. Your final exam to the next level is you got to pass a Judas. Am I making sense? I'm not saying that to discourage you. I'm saying that to you so you go with your eyes open and go, oh, that's why they're doing that. That's why they all of a sudden got all real ultra helpful. You know what I'm saying? So out of character for them. I've just been enjoying it, thinking, wow, what a blessing of the Lord. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> huh? So, come here, honey. I want to show you another little trick. Because some of y'all have felt like when somebody comes up to hug you, because it's church, you got to let them hug you. Listen, I love hugs. Don't get me wrong, I do. 
but there's right and wrong ways to do it, okay? This is my wife. If I want to hug her like this, I'm all about it. I can do that. Why? We're married. But if somebody that she's not married to comes in and wants to hug, watch what she does. She's going to turn sideways and sidearm them. Watch it again. I know it's sleight of hand. Oh, hey, Sister Rachel, how you doing? You're going to stick that. That wasn't even hard enough, honey. You got to stick that shoulder right up under there. You know what I'm saying? Now, now watch this. What, what, what you just did is you, you established a standard. Here's the problem. Is a lot of you don't want that standard. Because you like options. <laughs> You're serving sugar flakes up the street. Keep your eyes open, your heart attentive. Don't loathe a Judas. Use them. Use them. Let them be that graduation or that, that ribbon that you bust through for your graduation. You can't succeed and you can't be promoted without successfully navigating a Judas in your life. So don't be shocked or surprised when it happens. But for the love of God, pass it. God, I bless your people. I thank you for wisdom. Thank you for understanding. I thank you that you want us promoted to new levels. So you teach us hard lessons so we can pass. Make us aware and mindful and help us to be successful in navigating relationships so that first and foremost, we honor you. Make us the people of God that you've called us to be. In Jesus' precious name. For all those that caught the stream for any part of it, this was a unique one. We appreciate you joining us. I hope that you gleaned something. I hope that you were refreshed, encouraged, um, challenged. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love to have you here. 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City. Sunday afternoons at 2 p.m. Thursday evenings at 645 p.m. So until our ne next appointed time, God bless you. Have an incredible day.